so let's just launch right. Stalin! <laughs> this is the most important dude from the last half millennia, not because of who he was or what he did, but because of who he scared us. We were so terrified that we were going to have to face down the Red Army on the plains of Europe at the end of the war that we changed how everything would work because we knew we needed allies, not to stand behind us or shoulder to shoulder with us, but to stand in front of us to suck up ammo. And since the Europeans had just been through the toughest war in human history, volunteers for that sort of job were in short supply. So we had to bribe them. We had to change the way the world worked so that they would want to serve in that role. And so what we did was we sent out our Navy to patrol the global oceans, the only Navy that had survived the war, so that anyone could safely go anywhere at any time, interface with any market, any community, any commodity, without having to have a military escort. If in exchange, you would join the Cold War. Now, a lot of people call this different things. Some of it call it the Bretton Woods system. I call it the American-led order. You all know it as globalization. It has always been a security ploy by the United States to fight an enemy. But then World War II turned into the Cold War, turned into the end of the Cold War. And in 1992, the strategic justification for this system went away. And the Americans had never invested their economy in it because it was a strategic ploy. So we started down a spiral of ever more internally focused, narcissistic, populist political contests that brought in a series of leaders that bit by bit by bit backed away from the system, culminating with the last two. From an international economic point of view, the two most similar presidents we have ever had are Joe Biden and Donald Trump. The big difference between the two Trump tweeted out policy, Biden takes those tweets, runs them through a grammar checker, and puts them into the bureaucracy so they outlast him. The two most economically populous leaders we have ever had, and it's a strongly bipartisan push. Now, this whole strategy, it's collapse, us moving away, there's a thousand stories to tell here, but for this crowd, let's start with the money. This is net worth by age bracket, and it's a familiar story. You get older, you get better at your job, maybe you take a new job, maybe you start a business, your net worth goes up. But the real magic in North America begins at age 50, because that is the year where on average in the United States and Canada, your single biggest expense of your life, your youngest child, <laughs> becomes someone else's problem. And the money you save by being an empty nester, you use to pay down what is typically your second biggest expense, which is your homestead. And on average, by 55, that is paid down as well. So from 55 to 65, the 10 years before your retirement, your income's the highest it will ever be, your expenses are under control, that delta is 70% of global private capital. That is literally where the money is. And then you turn 65, and you retire, and you liquidate. Because if there's a currency crash or a market crash, you no longer have the income to recover. You'll be destitute. You'll have to live with the kids. And for those baby boomers out there, I think you know that your kids are the millennials and living together was a one-way experience from their point of view. <laughs> Don't count on that. So this is normal. This is typical, kind of boring. It's been like this for literally centuries until Stalin, because Stalin's effect changed the way we live. What Stalin did by helping the United States push towards globalization is we suddenly didn't just allow any business to go anywhere, any person could interface in that way as well. And if you started to take services jobs and manufacturing jobs, you weren't living on the farm anymore. And that changed the entire financial and consumption model of the human race. So this is the demographic profile for the Koreans at the dawn of the globalized period in the 50s. You got children on the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees on one side, men on one side, women on the other. It's this pyramid because of simple mortality. This is a primarily a country-based agricultural demographic. We're all living on farms. And when you live on farms, kids are free labor. You have as many of them as you can put up with plus one. It's the only way to find out what's too many. But they're free labor, that's the whole point. 
Now, this sort of model has some very specific economic and financial characteristics. There aren't a lot of people aged 55 to 65, so it's a capital poor environment. You have a lot of people under age 40. They're either kids or they're people who are having kids and building homes. The need for credit is huge, so the cost of credit is high, but it's growth driven because of all that consumption. But there's not much of a tax base. Low value add, high inflation. But with Stalin and globalization, we all moved from the farms into the cities, and in the cities, kids are no longer free labor. They're a free source of migraines. And adults are not stupid. So we had fewer of them, and here's the Koreans now. Radically different model. Suddenly, you're awash with that capital-rich demographic of people in their late 50s and early 60s. But you've run out of young people, so capital is cheap, the tax base is amazing, Government receipts are high, government services and infrastructure are great, technology is everywhere. But there's no longer enough people at the bottom to consume. And countering that is a workforce that has literally decades of expertise that is very productive. The whole world has gone through some version of this transition. At different speeds from different starting points, but we're all on the same highway here. And the Koreans, in the next few years, will lead us into something new. A world where that bulge in the population isn't young or isn't mature, it's retired. And we will have to figure out a fundamentally new economic model that is not based on consumption, on production, or on investment. What will that be? Not a clue. Never happened in human history before. We're making this up as we go. And the Koreans aren't alone. Bottom left, there are the Germans. Same basic model for the same basic reasons. This is their last decade as an industrialized power. They won't have a workforce. Now, for those of you who like Beamers, I suggest you get one now. <laughs> Probably need to get 10 years of parts to go with it because you're gonna need it. Because Germany, in the way we think of it, won't be there in six years. Now, the United States there at the top left, we're a little bit different. We're a little bit more of a chimney. A couple things that are different about our system. Number one, we never bet our economy on globalization. It was a bribe. If we had bet our system into it, we would have just been another occupying empire and there would have been no takers. So we industrialized more slowly and our birth rate dropped more slowly. Second, a lot of elbow room in the United States. Cost of living is cheaper. And that meant we didn't go from farm to city when we did industrialize. We went from farm to small town to suburb to city. And those two extra steps bought us a lot more time. So have our birth rates dropped? Absolutely. Not nearly as fast or as far as everyone else. If we keep aging at today's rate, we will be in a Korean German style situation around 2070. That's a lot of time to figure out another path. Top right, Mexico. You'll notice that it's a perfect pyramid until you hit about the 35-year-olds, and then it goes straight down. What happened 35 years ago? NAFTA. The Mexicans looked at what was on, after, on offer after World War II, like, wow, this sounds a lot like an American security plan. We want nothing to do with that. It wasn't until the W. Bush administration that the Cold War ended, the Mex Mexicans were like, well, I guess this is the only game in town. Sign us up, we'll do NAFTA. As soon as they did that, urbanization started, birth rate has now dropped by 60%. If they keep aging at their current rate, they will be in a Korean German style problem around 2080. They're just barely behind us in that process. But what this means is that since the birth rate has dropped off, net migration from Mexico to the United States has now been flat to negative for 14 straight years. It'll probably never be positive again. They've run out of young people. Most of the folks crossing the border in the South are Central Americans. But 10 years after NAFTA, we got something called CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, and the Central American demography looks just like Mexico's with a 10-year delay. So regardless of what you think of Democrats or Republicans or the border or immigration or workforce, know that the situation at the southern border is gonna look radically different in just a few years because the Central Americans are running out of people to send to. And then we have the Chinese. Now, this is already 
one of the five fastest aging workforces in the historical record. This is data from June of last year, which the Chinese have now said is wrong. In July, they updated it. <laughs> They're now asserting in official statistics that the drop in the birth rate from 2017 until now has been worse than what happened to the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. And this is still wrong. The Chinese Academy of Sciences, whose jobs it is to interpret the statistics that the government puts out, says that this overcounts the Chinese population by over 100 million people, with all of the missing millions folks who would have been born since the one-child policy was adopted 40 years ago, meaning that all of the missing millions are under 40, suggesting that these yellow bars don't even exist. There's nothing in the historical record that compares to this. Not in war, not in peace, not in plague, nothing. And this isn't even the low case scenario anymore. There are some Chinese demographers, several of which who are under house arrest now, who say that the real missing millions number is closer to 300 million. This is not survivable, period. China will cease to exist as a unified industrialized nation state within 10 years. That's the best case scenario now. Let's talk about us for a little bit. Now, our structure is a little different, but the most important thing that I can say here is this. The boomers are finally stopping mattering. Oh my God, that's just... <sighs> Fun. Half of the boomers, as of January of last year, had already moved into retirement. The snake is fi finally swallowing that damn watermelon. <laughs> now, because they're boomers and it all has to be about them, they're going to roll a couple grenades in the door on their way out. <laughs> Number one, capital. They were the largest generation, still are, which means they were the largest capital generating generation we've ever had. And as they were approaching retirement but had not yet retired, all that capital was available. A lot of the boom we've seen for the last 15 years is nothing more than the baby boomers shoving huge amounts of savings into the system as they prepare for retirement. Well, half of it has already been converted into T-bills and cash. We've seen capital costs go up by a factor of four, excuse me, a factor of three in the last four years. That's not the Fed. That's not the business cycle. That's not Trump. That's not Biden. That is the boomers. And as the rest of them retire, we can look forward to the cost of capital tripling again in the next few years. This will last until another large generation, in this case the millennials, ages into their mid-50s. So we've got two things we're going to get from the millennials. Number one, the older millennials turn 45 this year. We have ahead of us 15 years of the greatest drama in reality television. <laughs> All the millennials having midlife crises at the same time, oh my God. <laughs> but second, when they hit their mid-50s, the cost of capital will finally come down. We just have to wait 10, 12 years. Second, largest generation ever is another way of saying largest workforce ever. Half the, half the boomers have already retired. The new generation coming in, as Oliver pointed out, is the smallest generation ever. The differences between the exiting Zoomers and the entering, I'm sorry, the difference between the exiting boomers and the entering Zoomers last year was 500,000 shortest just for the year. That number will go up every year for the next 12 before peaking at a shortage for one year of roughly a million workers. How do we know? They're already here. There's also a qualitative problem. Boomers have their faults, but they're relatively spread out throughout the entire worker cadre, white collar, blue collar, you name it. Zoomers are different. Zoomers are incredibly hardworking, incredibly loyal. They were raised by Xers, so they were raised to know that Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid will not be there for them and that they can't rely on anyone. And of course, Xers kick them out of the house as soon as they turn 17. <laughs> they see jobs as a chance of salvation. They will follow you into hell, virtually. 
they never want to meet you in person. <laughs> Dream job coding in a closet at home that locks from the inside. <laughs> That's going to be a problem moving forward in any number of ways. Comparatively, let's look at where, where it's at. These are the demographic, excuse me, this is the, the pay period for a number of Southeast Asian countries that I think are actually do pretty well in a post-globalized environment. They've got healthy demographic structures. Here's our Mexican partners right in the middle, hyper-competitive, and here are the Chinese. Labor costs in China are up by a factor of 15 since the year 2000, but the productivity of the Chinese worker hasn't even tripled. They are no longer the low-cost producer. And they never became skilled enough to become the high-cost producer. There is not a manufacturing subsector on the planet today where the Chinese are the obvious choice from a price point of view. Everyone who has tried to reshore, deshore, offshore, friendshore, whatever word you want to use for what's going on right now, has discovered that after the process is paid for, they have a simpler supply chain system with fewer steps, higher quality, and lower cost. So why do we still talk about China as an industrial power? Sunk cost of the industrial plant. That's $35 trillion. You do not move away from that in a short period of time, and you certainly don't do it for free. But we are now on the clock, and we can see the end of the Chinese system from where we are. And anyone who front loads is going to discover something a lot different from the people who don't. Because you can either front load and build out your capacity in an environment of constrained capital and labor, or you can wait to all the laggards try to do it at the same time and there's no product. So, you know, no pressure. All right, let's talk capital. This is the private credit curve for the United States. This is all sources of private capital to all destinations. Everything except the interbank window. Okay. From 2000, at the beginning of this chart on the left, to that bump in the middle, that's the subprime build. We doubled total private credit in seven and a half years. As a result, we got some bubbles, we had the subprime crash, and we had a recession that knocked 5% off of headline GDP. This is our baseline. Seven and a half years, doubling of credit, 5% correction. Everybody remember that process? Everyone remember what that was like? Okay. Same data, different scale. Here are our Canadian neighbors. Do we have any Canadians here today? Wow, you guys should be in charge of border security. Oh, they're up there. <laughs> okay, I would argue that from 2000 to 2007, the Canadians had the best banking sector in the world. Best run, lowest risk. They had done none of the things that we had done. They didn't have a subprime sector. They didn't have this thing called asset-backed securities. But after the financial crisis and the Great Recession, they had a very Canadian response to what happened down here. They were like, Americans just had the greatest recession ever. We can totally have a greater recession. <laughs> and they disassembled every safety system across their entire sector. They did everything that we did wrong, but like with more effort. They got to about 2013, 2014, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe we don't want to win this one. And they dialed it back. They're not out of the woods, but I do feel better about Canadian finance and banking today than I have in the last 10 years, and I get my good news where I can these days. All right, Germany. If you want to buy a home in Germany, you do not get your 20% deposit down and go to finance the other 80% at the bank. No, no, no. You go to the bank, you declare your intentions, right? Great. Today, write us a check for what you anticipate your monthly payment being, and then come back in a month and do it again, and again, and again. Do that 60 times. And once you have proven that you are not a credit risk because you now have a five-year track record with us, then you can apply for a mortgage. The German system faces several systemic issues, many of which I think will kill the system. Credit overextension is not on the list. <laughs> That's more of a Greek thing. 
Sevenfold increase of credit in seven years. We know that story. As of COVID, their GDP had already collapsed by 55%, and of course, COVID screwed up the data for everybody. Here's Australia. I love the Australians. They're like us, but with character. <laughs> now, Australia and the United States have very similar governing philosophies. Most decisions are made at the state and the local level, and the only things they put at the top are things that really there's no substitute for very concentrated authority, and finance falls into that category. So I'll give you an example of how we did it versus how they did it. Uh, during subprime, at the, at the very peak of the crisis, Sheila Baer of the FDIC and Paulson at Treasury and Bernanke at the Fed crowded around a two-top at a bar in D.C. and in less than an hour worked out the details for what we would soon know as TARP, the restitution program that helped bail people out and put a floor to the crisis and set the stage for recovery. Had a very, very American characteristic to it. If you had done something dumb as a lender or a lendee, you were on the hook for some of the loss. The money wasn't free. The Australians did a similar program on a similar time frame with one big difference. It didn't have that last little catch. They just guaranteed everyone's mortgages. Furthermore, if you could prove that you could make your monthly payment with a 100% government guarantee, you automatically qualified for a second mortgage. And a third. And a fourth. The Australians have not yet begun their correction. And when they do, you do not want to be down under. India, same basic program as the Australians, but to qualify for the funds, you had to be a personal friend of the prime minister. <laughs> and here are the Chinese. Let me bring that down for you. <laughs> this is what we're intimidated by? The whole system is a badly run Enron. Now, you'll get growth when there's a bottomless supply of 0% loans that you don't have to pay back. Of course you'll get growth, but it's not healthy and it's not sustainable. And you get some weird stuff. Housing is, of course, one that some people are familiar with. You've all heard what's going on in their system right now. I'll give you an idea of the scale here. Spare housing units in China, unlived in spare housing units in China, are so numerous that they could put up another 1.5 to 3 billion people. That's more spare housing than the rest of the planet combined by a factor of five. That stuff's probably worth 10 cents on the dollar, maybe 15. And that's 70% of private savings. That's not even the sector that's most affected. That would be agriculture. So when this goes down, and it will go down, we don't just get a subprime style collapse in every economic subsector at the same time. We also get a political revolution because people have seen their life savings destroyed, and we get famine. There are many, many things about the Chinese system I am concerned about. Their strength isn't on the list. Now, this is where you would anticipate that an authoritarian government with a brain trust and fingers into everything and control, not having to deal with any activists or debate, can take the long view and plan out a recovery program or at least, you know, nudge the picture a little bit. Yeah, that is not the government the Chinese have. They've got Xi Jinping who has built the tightest cult of personality in human history. Tighter than Mao, tighter than Caligula. And he has executed or imprisoned or exiled or intimidated to silence everyone in the country with a positive IQ. And he has established himself as the sole decision maker, but his punishments have been so lavish and so often and his purge is so complete that no one will bring him information. Not information they think will piss him off, anything, because they don't know the status of the voices in his head. And so the bureaucracy has tried to address this by simply no longer collecting information that they think he might not want to hear. So for example, COVID, when they started to open, they just stopped collecting death data. Did one million people die? Did 100 million people die? We have no idea. It's not that they collected the data and didn't share it. They just stopped collecting. 
Youth unemployment data, they thought that was embarrassing. It's not even a metric anymore. The bond market, they collect no data on what's on offer or who bought it or who sold it. How do you even have a bond market then? The ones that worry me more, political, autobiograph sorry, political biographies of local leaders and college dissertations, none of it's collected because it prevents an entire new generation from ever getting into the system in the first place. If they're not in the system, they can't challenge G. Couple anecdotes to give you an idea of just how bad it's gotten. You guys remember back to January of 21 when the lights went out in Beijing and we had a year of rolling brown and blackouts nationwide. No one told Xi. Finally, in September, he found out, six months on, and you know who told him? Joe Biden. Now, don't get mad at Uncle Joey. He didn't know it was a secret. <laughs> we could see it from space. It was in USA Today. It came up on a Zoom call. Can you imagine being the bureaucrat in the back of the room there? He's like, oh, oh, I just, I just have to be anywhere else. <laughs> took six months for him to fix the problem because he was the only decision maker. And until it was brought to his attention, no one would do anything to fix it. But I think the best example I can give you is that stupid balloon. Now, when that thing floated in from Canada, thanks for that, by the way, Canada, <laughs> I had the same response as the American executive. Clearly, this is a spy platform. It's 350 feet across. It's dangling something the size of an Embraer jet. You guys know Embraers? The Barbie dream jets with like two seats on one side and one on the other, and they're cramped and they're tiny, unless they're hanging from a balloon, in which case, got some heft. Clearly, it's a spy platform. Shoot it down. Let's see specifically what we have. I am not a balloon expert. Neither is Joe Biden. But... We in the United States do not have a problem with information transmission in the way that the Chinese system does. So somewhere in the bowels of the Pentagon is that guy, the creepy one with the comb over that they put at the hall at the end of, 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 the end of wherever, no one else wants to go up against the physical plant because nobody wants to see him. He's a balloon expert. He's like, I love balloons. And his report <laughs> rose up to the top and the CIA director and the defense chief sat down with the president and said, Mr. President, please don't shoot this balloon down. We do not think it's a national security threat. We know exactly where it's going to go. It's going to float over our missile silos in Montana. But Mr. President, unless you're keeping something from us at the cabinet meetings, it doesn't sound like you're about to nuke someone. Mr. President, the hatches will be closed. They're always closed. They'll get photos of closed hatches from seven miles away. This is not a threat. What it is, Mr. President, is an opportunity. Because if you let us do our jobs, we're gonna put a spy platform on a plane above it and another one on a spy helicopter below it and we will direct every whisper sensor we can onto this thing and we'll track the son of a bitch over the next nine days. We will get copies of all of their cryptography We'll see which satellites they're using to bounce commands off of. We'll see how they're using our civilian network to send messages. And Mr. President, a reminder, the NSA has more offensive hacking capacity than the combined governments of the rest of the planet. So if you let us do our jobs, Mr. President, in nine days, we're going to be able to tell you not what city or what building or what floor or what office, but what terminal is controlling this thing. And we will hack the tar out of that terminal. And we will tag every individual that comes into contact with it, and we will rip the guts out of their intel system and turn it inside out to examine at our leisure. So Uncle Joe says, yeah, yeah, do that. <laughs> so we did. It was the intelligence breakthrough of the decade, and they just handed it to us. We now know from the after action that Xi was unaware of the balloon until after it had been shot down. It was just some asshat in their intelligence directorate who thought, this is what wolf warrior diplomacy means. This is how you stick it to the American. It was stupid. The stupidest thing I have seen any government do in the last 20 years. And if you think back on the last two decades, <laughs> we have not exactly had a shortage of dumb. <laughs> But this is happening now at every level of government decision-making, across every economic sector. 
10 years is how long the Chinese have if nothing goes wrong. They're perfectly capable of having state failure between now and then. Okay, now whether this is disastrous or horrible or wonderful depends upon who you are and what you care about. So a few quick categories. Number one, I'm not worried about banking. When the Russians invaded Ukraine, every Western financial institution cut their exposure to Russian banks to zero. And then the Chinese flooded into that space and every Western bank was like, wow, that's like screaming for sanctions. So they cut their Chinese exposure as well. The total holdings of all Western banks to all Chinese banks is now less than 1% of their international portfolios. Problem solved. Second, I'm not worried about goods exports. China's hyper-financialization system means that they produce, they subsidize the production of anything they physically can do. It doesn't matter if they do it well. If they can do it with a bottomless supply of money, they will do it so they don't have to import anything. Which means the total value of all their goods imports is only about 4.5% of GDP. Now, that's not zero, but that's the difference between a bad quarter and something worse. Commodities is where it gets ugly. The Chinese overproduce everything. It's an employment strategy. That means they're the world's largest importer of pretty much every commodity category. Now, that, those kind of get broken into two categories. First, you have your industrial commodities. That's gonna be a bit of a roller coaster because we're gonna to have to rebuild a lot of industrial plant elsewhere when we lose the Chinese stuff. And so there's gonna be a lot of this as we figure out what we need and when. And then you got the food stuff. China is both the world's largest importer of agricultural product and the world's largest, and the world's largest importer of the things that go into agricultural products. So they can't grow the stuff themselves without outside help and they buy a lot of food. That is going to be rock solid demand until the day China collapses and then it just, because the last thing a government does before it dies is interfere with food supply. But if you're looking for something to stress about, this is where you should look. This is a fun little inflation graphic from the American Enterprise Institute. The double yellow arrow, that's average inflation since the year 2000, roughly 75%. Everything below that has gotten relatively cheaper in real terms. Everything above it has gotten more expensive. Now, I'm oversimplifying here quite a bit, but everything above that line requires fingers, eyes, skills, and souls. It's people, healthcare, for example. Everything below that is something you plug into a wall and it beeps. It's a manufactured product. We are very good at the stuff at the top. The Chinese are very good at the stuff on the bottom, largely because of that subsidization system. The Chinese have pushed down the cost of manufactured goods for all of us for the entire modern period. And we need to get used to that not being the case because if all we do is rebuild the industrial supply chain and change no processes at all, we're not gonna subsidize it to the degree that the Chinese are. So just the base cost has to go up. And that's something we're gonna be struggling with for the next decade. All right, inflation. Uh, there's two stories of inflation. The first one's pretty short. It's about where we are now. There on the far right. We've had it coming down for basically a year. Two things going on there. Number one, labor. Baby boomers are moving out. I'd say one quarter of the inflation impulses we've seen in the last few years is simply the labor market tightening. We know that's going to get worse as we move forward, and it will not be 20 years before we're back where we were in the teens. Second, COVID. If you think back to the COVID days, a lot moved. Every time we had an opening or a closing or a new vaccine or a new variant or the anti-vaxxers threw a fit or the hypochondriacs got a hold of policy, whatever it was, every time something changed, we changed how we consume. And we were on this, it wasn't even a roller coaster, it was more like a slingshot hooked up to a bungee cord. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And every time something changed, the industrial supply chains had to adjust and it takes them about 18 months to shift to adapt to what we say we want. Well, if you think back, about 26, 27 months ago, Texas, Arizona, Florida reopened for the last time. And over the next six months, every other American state save California, plus Alberta, opened as well. 
And then finally, three to six months later, California and the rest of Canada opened up. It's been 18 months. We've seen inflation coming down. We've gotten through this process. Probably will continue to tick down a little bit more as we kind of work out the last couple of kinks. That's our, that's our near-term future. Further out, we really need to look back to understand the scale of what we're about to face. Post-World War II, we've had three big phases of inflation in North America. The first one is that initial urbanization and industrialization push where we built our cities, we ran power to the countryside, and we laid our interstate highway system. We had 15 years of industrial, demand-driven inflation. And then the baby boomers came of age, had their kids, built their homes. And we had two decades of consumer demand-driven inflation. And of late, we've been living in this weird-ass period. The Chinese brought a billion workers into play and subsidized production for everyone, pushing down the cost of finished goods. And the Russian system dissolved at the Soviet death, pouring an empire of raw materials into global markets, pushing prices down for commodities. And that lasted for three decades. For most of us, this is the sum total of our professional experience. But it's the most atypical period in human history, and it's over. Whether because of war or sanctions or lack of maintenance, the Russian stuff is going away. And the Chinese labor is literally dying out. The disinflationary trends are gone, and they're not coming back. But at the same time, those inflationary trends are here. The boomers may be retiring, taking their consumption with them, but their kids, the millennials, are at the peak of the consuming years. That has another eight to 10 years to run. And if we still want stuff in a post-Chinese, post-Germany environment, we're going to have to build it ourselves. We have to double the size of the industrial plant on this continent, and we need to do it as soon as possible. That means we're going to have 9 to 15% inflation until 2030. Now, before you have a stroke or call your broker, <laughs> deep breath, double the size of the industrial plant. That means local workers taking local orders from local consumers, producing local and local infrastructure with local inputs, which use more technology and less energy, and fewer supply chain steps that are simpler and more productive. And when we're done with this transition, we will have a system for manufacturing that is largely immune to international shocks. Folks, this, this is not a good story this is the story of the fastest economic growth in the history of Mexico and Canada and the United States. It's just that it's not a straight line and we have some work to do. I'll give you an idea of what some of that looks like. If you're at the bottom of this matrix, your supply chain is simple. You can fit it all into the back of a cocktail napkin. If you're at the top, you have no idea who your fourth tier suppliers are, much less your 14th. If you're on the left, your system is rooted in the Chinese mainland system, and if you're on the right, you're already managed to break into NAFTA. So a few examples. Energy, this is easy. American capital, American workers, American steel, American pipe, American midstream, American production, American processing, American consumption, okay? Oh my God, no. <laughs> the iPhone has 1,700 supply chain steps, 91%, I'm sorry, they're down to 90% of it, it touches mainland China in some way. In the last three years, it's gone from 91 to 90. Ooh, progress. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but when the president of, or CEO of Foxconn declared that he was running for the presidency of Taiwan, <laughs> every Apple facility and every Foxconn facility in mainland China suddenly found themselves the target of a tax evasion investigation. Yeah, they're gonna lose it all, probably within two years. So if you're an Apple guy like me, be sure you have a spare Apple phone because we're getting near the point where there's not gonna be another model for a while. All right, I'm gonna run through a few of these for you. First of all, if you're looking to stress about something, this is what you should stress about because if we don't get these three right, we really can't try the rest. Uh, chemicals, luckily, 
we are well into. One of the many, many things that came out of the shale revolution is we now have low quality, I'm sorry, low price, high quality petrocarbons, and our chemical sector has expanded to metabolize that. So most of the intermediate products that we then use to make manufactured goods, we are already the world's largest supplier for most of them. So check. Machinery. Think of it as things that build other things. The Germans are the best in the world at that. We're going to lose them. Luckily, Houston is number two. Any Houstonians? Why are you here? <laughs> Go home, build more of this stuff. <laughs> we need at least to triple output, at least. And then there's electrical steel. Surface economy is all great and all, doesn't require a lot of electricity compared to like physically stamping and moving things. So we need to expand our power grid by about 50%. That assumes no green transition, which means we need a lot of electrical steel. In fact, we need to expand that by quite a bit. You normally only produce a lot of electrical steel when you're electrifying for the first time, which for us was in, our, in the 60s and the 50s. So we need to expand the output of that by at least a factor of 30. And I would expect the folks from Indiana are going to be doing everything they can to help with that. This is the other fly in the ointment. A lot of the raw materials come from a process state in China where the infrastructure has been deliberately subsidized. And so whether it is aluminum or lithium or anything else, we need to build this out too. Now it's not expensive, it doesn't even take a lot of time, but that doesn't mean it's free in an instant. And until that stuff is produced here at scale, it's difficult to see us pulling the rest of it off. If you're gonna really worry about something in terms of end product, this is the one. The reason the East Asians excel at electronics is not simply Chinese subsidization. It, they have a very differentiated labor market because the person who does the coding is not the person who does the motherboard, is not the person who does the die cast or the wiring or the coding or the painting or the lenses, whatever it is. Those are all different labor skill sets that are at different labor price points. And the East Asian system has roughly 13 major categories when it comes to quality and quantity. In North America, we have two. Anglo-America, Mexico, that's it. Which means if all we do is relocate the industry here and we run it the same way, we're gonna need at least another six million workers. That's probably not viable. But before you get depressed about that, there is a case study that suggests it's actually gonna be much easier than we think. Textiles in this country used to be, when I say use pre-NAFTA, used to be a very simple model. Appalachian women on sewing machines. And then with NAFTA, all those jobs picked up and moved to Mexico. And then it was Mexican women with sewing machines. And then with the World Trade Organization, it picked up and moved again, and then it was Chinese and Indian women with sewing machines. But then COVID hit, and everyone shut down at the same time, and we no longer had clothes. And we're not Swedish. So this was never going to work. <laughs> and what we discovered is that there was another way. And now in North Carolina, there are facilities that are two acres under one roof that take raw cotton in, clean it, turn it into thread, yarn, clothes, and the end product that leaves has a cheaper per garment price than what comes out of Bangladesh. These facilities have a staff of two, a software engineer and a mechanic. The technology had evolved, but it wasn't until the old model stopped that we even thought to look for what else might work. We're gonna find other things like this, but not until we look. And I would rather do the looking before we're all naked. <laughs> all right, here's a messy one, semiconductors. Okay, oversimplification. You can split the semiconductor market into three rough pieces. You've got your dumb chips, 90 nanometers and bigger, your internet of things, your smart refrigerator. You've got your medium quality, 10 to 90. This is aerospace, this is automotive, this is power management, uh, this is most smartphones that are not top end. And then you've got your high end chips, 10 nanometer and smaller. That's artificial intelligence and electric vehicles and satellite communications and the iPhone. Now, the dumb chips, 80% of those come from China. So if you want a singing margarita machine, it's already too late. <laughs> Your high-end chips, 
90% of those come from one town in Taiwan. That makes it sound a lot better than it is. Because while the Taiwanese built and run those fab facilities, they didn't do it alone. It required a constellation of over 9,000 suppliers, half of which only produce one product for one end user and have no international competition to speak of. It is globalization and specialization in its purest form. It is the sector most dependent on everything working together, and so it is the, most, the sector that is most threatened now. Until we rebuild that ecosystem somewhere else, and that'll take 10 years, we're gonna lose the high-end chips almost completely. And that means, among other things, electric vehicles go away. That means, among other things, artificial intelligence. We have another 10 years to figure out the details because we're not gonna be able to do it at scale. The stuff in the middle, the 10 to the 90, that comes from 13 different countries. There are redundant competitive ecosystems that make that happen. You could peel entire continents off the planet and that would still work. Feel pretty good about that. So the stuff we always use, that's fine. It's the stuff on the edges, the very high and the very low. That's where the problem is. Okay, we're looking here at a map of the former Soviet space. It is on its side, so if you tilt your head, that's, tilt your head, that's okay. Uh, on the right, we have a population density map, and that lighter color of orange going from Central Europe into Central Eurasia, that is roughly the population density of Nebraska if you remove Lincoln and Omaha. So there are people there, but like only technically. <laughs> you move to the left, you're looking at a climate and economic map. Now that green zone that overlies the populated part of Russia, that is the wheat belt. That is the part of Russia that is worth having from an economic point of view, you can live there. But if you go to the left, the yellow, that's desert. If you go to the right, the blue, that is tundra and tegai. Those are both empty and worthless. But what drives the Russians to binge drink? is the tan on the shoulders. Territories that even by Russian standards are economically worthless, but they're flat and they're open, and you can totally run a Mongol horde through there. So, Russian strategy back to the beginning has been to expand out of the green through the beige until they reach a series of geographic barriers that you can't run panzers through. And then forward position their relatively incompetent slow-moving troops in the access points between. Post-Soviet Russia lost control of all of those access points, and by shrinking in size, it exposed its frontiers and it had a 5,000-mile external border that was potentially hostile. If they can get back to where they were under Stalin's time, that 5,000 miles shrinks down to under 500. Those are gaps that they can plug. The Ukraine war was always going to happen because they were always on the way to those plugs. And if Ukraine falls, the Russians will then do the next logical thing and take it to the places where the plugs actually exist. This is the ninth post-Soviet war that the Russians have participated in. It will not be the last. Now, when the war began, a lot of us were like, wow, this is gonna be over really fast. There was a 40 mile long convoy coming down from Belarus to Kiev and that convoy had more military firepower than the entire pre war Ukrainian military. And we're like, wow, one week. I thought it would be quick. I didn't think it would be this quick. And then on the fourth day of the war, the convoy stopped because the Russians forgot fuel. <laughs> and three days later, soldiers got out of their equipment and walked back to Belarus because they also forgot food. And we discovered that the Russian military isn't a military. It's a mob with guns. And that's a very different thing. And I don't know anyone at the Pentagon or Whitehall that was happy about this. Because if there's anything we know about the Russians, it's that this, this is how they see the world, and they're broadly correct. But if Ukraine falls, and the Russian army then goes for those gaps, goes for Poland and Romania, NATO states, they will come up across, come up against the most powerful combined forces militaries in human history, and they will be obliterated. They will face 1,000 to 1 casualty ratios. But they can't stop, and so every card they have to play will be played, and the nukes will fly, and we will lose Atlanta and Detroit. So the decision was made very, very, very early 
that any weapon system that the Ukrainians can prove that they can operate and maintain, maintain, very important word there, the Germans insisted on that one. Any weapon system that you use once is not a weapon system, it's a paperweight. You operate and maintain, they can have. Everything else is details. There are a lot of details, but that was the decision that was made very, very early, and I think it was broadly right, because it's a lot cheaper to defeat the Russians using someone else's blood on a different hemisphere than it is to rebuild an American city. Now, that has, of course, lots of connotations itself. Uh, this is central Siberia, in case anyone's looking for a summer home. <laughs> These are thermokarst lakes. It's in the permafrost. Basically, you've got this layer of ground somewhere between a half an inch down or 10 meters down, where below it, it never gets warm enough in the summer to melt. So it's permanently frost. But in the summer, the top layer melts, and you sometimes get lakes like these. If you want to produce something in a zone like this, you wait for winter for everything to be frozen solid. And then you build a berm up across the frozen wasteland, and you run a piece of infrastructure, a road, a rail, a pipe down that line until you get to one of these production sites, and then you drill in the winter. It's the highest up co upfront cost for mineral development on the planet. And it's a dynamic landscape. It doesn't stay like this. If an aquifer cracks open, the whole thing slides to the side. Or if the aquifer drains down, you get a sinkhole. Or maybe you just get an abnormally warm summer, and so some more frost melts. Well, when melted stuff refreezes, it expands, and the land bubbles. These are all really bad for infrastructure. And so the Russians have the highest maintenance costs for any mineral production in the world. And the Russian educational system collapsed in the mid 80s when the Soviet Union was failing. So the youngest people in Russia who are worthy of the title engineer, they turned 64 this year. You think you have a skilled labor problem? Oh my. And so the Russians haven't been the ones doing this work. It's been BP, it's been Exxon, and especially the Dutch and the Germans, and they all stopped the first month of the war. All of this is gonna go away. Will it take a day, a year, 10 years? I don't know. But every bit of mineral output that comes out of the Russian system, we need to prepare to get on along without. That's a problem but compare it to what we have to work with. All right, who lives on this map? Upper Midwest, woohoo. Well, as you guys know, this is the most important urban center in the history of civilization. <laughs> this is Marshalltown, Iowa, where I'm from. <laughs> Here we have Bismarck, North Dakota. Should you find yourself in Bismarck, you're gonna have to ask yourself the very serious, soul-searching question, how? And this is not a frat party. Western North Dakota, population four. It's lit up because of a problem with transport. Now, oil's a liquid. It conforms to the shape of its container. You can put it into a rail truck, you can put it into a tanker truck, whatever you want. But natural gas is a gas, it's in the name. It disperses, and you have to have a pressurized system to collect it, to transport it, and to use it at the same pace that you produce it because storage is nearly impossible. Now, in the US, we enjoy the world's largest and most redundant natural gas distribution system, but we can't keep up with what's bubbling up out of the shale oil projects as a byproduct. And so until we can build out that infrastructure, we have to flare it. You can see that from space, it's the same in Texas. That means we follow a different economic model for our energy sector. Because for us, natural gas is functionally free. Anyway, that means that we have a short turnaround time for production, and we have lower chronic costs. Even at the height of the Ukraine war, when it looked like it was all going to go to hell, and we had natural gas prices hit $6 per thousand cubic feet, <laughs> yeah, the Europeans hit 90. This is our new norm. We do a little bit of this down here, and they're doing this up here. It makes everything easier. Our chemical sector is run by this stuff now. No one else's is. All right, let's talk agriculture because I haven't depressed anyone yet. <laughs> Two colors here to pay attention to. First, the dark green. Those are the parts of the world that were producing agricultural products at scale before 1945. 
These are places where the combination of land quality and climate are sufficiently positive that you don't need fuel, fertilizer, and the rest. It's not that those things aren't useful. I'm not suggesting that everyone start going out with a hoe and doing it at scale that way. No, 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 no. I'm just saying that these are the places that have a legacy because of climate. The areas in light green are the zones that have been added since 1945. These areas can only produce large volumes with industrial style technologies and inputs, tractors, fuel, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer. One of the things that globalization has brought us is a world in which all of the light greens can play, but they're dependent upon those inputs. They don't work without them, and that's a problem. I'm just gonna pick one here, fertilizer. You've got your three main nutrients, nitrogen, phosphate, potash. The big number there is the percentage that the United States imports. Now you'll notice that for the top two, nitrogen and phosphate were basically self-sufficient. Our exposure is for potash. We take nine tenths of it from somewhere else, but most of that is from these yahoos. So, you know, they're good for something. This is the only chunk of our fertilizer input system that comes from a climate or a danger zone. This is stuff from the former Soviet world. Here's Australia and Brazil. We're not done. This is the stuff that comes from China, and this is the stuff that comes from the Middle East. We, as a species, are woefully unprepared for what's about to happen. You break down global trade in any appreciable format, and we lose the ability to feed three billion people. How we adapt to that is the defining struggle of our era. Here's where it will hurt most. Countries in red, excuse me, countries in dark blue and dark green are the world's major producers and exporters of grain and soy. Everyone else is a net importer, and if you disrupt the supply system, these are the countries facing at least a 40% reduction in their ability to grow the crop in the first place. If we're lucky, if we think forward, if automation and GMOs do everything we hope they do, we only lose a billion people by 2050. If not everything goes well, well, that gets ugly fast. Now, if you're an American or Canadian farmer and you're looking at this, you're like, I don't see an X. You're right. You're going to try to feed the world. You're going to come up short. And then you're going to look at your bank account. You're probably going to get over it. <laughs> All right. Let me take a big dump on the green transition, and then we will end with some politics. <laughs> All right. I'm oversimplifying again, but thermal power, fossil fuel-based power, is not all that complicated. You light a match, you start something on fire, you capture the heat, you're done. If you want to do green tech, the generation, the transmission, the storage of green tech power is an order of magnitude more complicated, requires more components with more materials. At the top, you've got a traditional electronic vehicle. At the bottom, an internal combustion engine. You can just see at a glance. Same goes for power generation. You got your green tech at the top, you got your conventional thermal at the bottom. If we are serious about what we say we want to do for the climate, we need three times as much copper, 10 times as much nickel, 18 times as much lithium, four times as much chromium, and on and on and on, 20 different materials that we need vastly greater supplies of now, certainly by 2030. We have never as a species doubled the volume of any industrial material that was already in use previously. No, this will not happen. This cannot happen. It's not physically possible for this to happen. And we have to do it without the Chinese processing or without these, which primarily come from Russia. No, unless every arrow on here is where one of those materials is sourced. If we take the US military, which has rested and recouped from the war on terror, and send it back out in the world to conquer all of those arrows, and run a Belgian imperial-style extraction system, and ship it all here, then we can do this. <laughs> no one else, just us. That is not a recommendation. I'm just saying that this is the only way that the path we're on right now works. All right, 
The dark red are areas where solar technology today makes both environmental and economic sense. When you move into the orange, the economic case fails. It's one of the reasons why the Inflation Reduction Act is there to help improve the economics for the orange zones. But by the time you get to green, you will never generate enough electricity from your panels to pay down the carbon debt that it took to manufacture and install them in the first place. If you commit to solar in the green, you're actually increasing your carbon footprint. People tell me that the Germans are good at math. I beg to differ. <laughs> Same concept, but now wind instead of solar. Red, good, green, bad. All right, I'm going to combine these now. The blue are the places where wind is great today. The green is places where solar is great today. And the dark green is where they're both good. Now, if we were smart in an era of more expensive capital and labor and materials, what we would do is we would build out generating infrastructure in these zones and run power cables from them to where we actually live. That's the smart play. We are not going to do that because we have a political problem. All right, final slide. If you're at the top of this, you want the government out of your personal life. If you're at the bottom, you think the government should play a role in regulating social norms. If you're on the left, you think the government should have its hands in people's wallets to get the resources necessary to remake society. And if you're on the right, you want the government out of your wallet. And if you're in a corner, you can combine these. So for example, if you're at the top right, a social, and an, a social liberal and an economic conservative, you really appreciate all the bureaucrats in DC, and you want to get them all together for a party where you serve arsenic cake. <laughs> or if you're at the top left, you're an economic and a social liberal, uh, you look forward to the glorious day where we're all dancing around the fire, holding hands, singing kumbaya, wearing burlap gunny sacks uh, that were paid for by the confiscation of all private property. Okay? <laughs> Here are our political factions, red for Republican, blue for Democrat, green for traditional swing voters. The single biggest impact that Donald Trump has had on the system yet is that he elevated a faction to prominence who really hadn't voted for the last 30 years and made them the single most numerous and politically powerful group in the country. But in doing so, he also picked fights with other factions that were traditionally Republicans. I would call these the traditional adults in the room. I dare say that some of you might fall into this oval. And what Donald Trump did is he drove these people out of his administration, out of the Republican Party institutions, and actually campaigned against their champions in Congress and turned them into swing voters. But he also succeeded in reaching out and bringing in other groups who were closer to his social conservative core supporters. And so this today is the Republican coalition. It's powerful, it's cohesive, but it doesn't have enough votes to win. That's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two, the unions are now swing voters. Trump was very successful at pulling them out of the Democratic coalition. And the question now is which side are they gonna end up on? We don't know. What we do know is we need to double the size of the industrial plant in an environment of less labor. Most of the jobs we need to add are blue collar. We are at the dawn of the golden age of organized labor in this country. The business community are also swing voters. Now this, this is just odd. Unions and business have been part of the conversation, the dominant part of the conversation of making economic policy in this country since the beginning. They haven't always been on opposite sides, but they've always been in the room. And now, for the first time in American history, they are not. If you look at economic policy under either Trump or Biden, you're like, what asshat made this up? It's because the people who can do math are not at the table. And until such time as the unions, the business community, or both get into one coalition or another again, this is what we have to deal with because the folks who think they can make economic policy fall into two categories. On one side, you have MAGA, who sees business as the enemy, and you've got the Greens, who see business as something who should be punished. This is not a stable system, and it won't last. These transitions we're going through typically take four to 12 years. We are now in year six. Hopefully, the parties will have shaken down and reformed themselves by the next cycle. 
hopefully. But until then, national policy making is functionally incapable of being part of the solution. And so it's your fault if it goes wrong, because it's up to you. All right, that's enough. Um, here are a few more things to think about. These are the, the ones that we touched on, at least in brief. There's a lot of stuff about the world that we understand that just isn't going to be there much longer, and we have to create a new world. So get to it. All right. Thank you very much.